folks, you're welcome to my front garden. I actually have just come out to do my quiet time and spend some time with God, but I really feel that tonight is the night that I should record this message. I've come out to the garden because I've just spent some time on the phone, a video call to a mother that is completely broken, distressed. In fact, I quote to you, she said to me on the video call, she just does not know what else to do right now. She's broken because of a family member. And so I come out to the garden and here I am, forgive me, I'm sitting in a pair of floral shorts and a wee shirt. This is just what I do in the evenings. So I was thinking throughout this day, that video call was one of three encounters I've had today. Two other were face-to-face -face conversations with broken people. Some were personally broken. Two of them, the one I mentioned on the video call and another one is broken about family members and family situations. And all three of them had this question on their lips. Does God really care? I mean, does Jesus Christ really care about what we're going through right now? Is he concerned? And I could have been so super spiritual, like many people do, and, and bombard them three people with loads of verses. And that is so easy to do when you're not in that situation, when you have not been through depression, when you have not been through the valley of the shadow of death, when you have not faced family, complete family breakdown. It's so easy to come and pat someone on the back and tell them, boys, God's in control, God's got this. And so God is in control. But, but that's not what they need to hear because they are broken, they are hurting. And so often we come with that most misquoted, misused verse in the whole of scripture. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, to do you good, to give you a bright, expected future. And that's a great verse. I love that verse. But why not show folk the other side of the coin? Because before them, plans of prosperity and a bright future and God showering blessing upon the people. Do you know what has to happen first? 70 years of brokenness, barrenness, and then the blessing comes. And so I sit before you, I'm, I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. There is absolutely no way that you'll ever hear me say, come to Jesus Christ and your life will completely become smooth sailing. It'll be beautiful. You'll get a new house, new car, new finances, because that's not what this book says. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he never said, take up your couch and follow me. He said, take up your cross. Cross, when he spoke those words, was associated with pain, suffering and death. And so I come out and I'm sitting thinking about those three individuals. Does God care? Does the Lord Jesus Christ care? how I'm feeling, what I'm going through. So I'm just reading my wee pocket Bible here. I hope you don't mind in the garden. It's a little amplified version. I love it. And I came to this verse, Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the throngs, he being the Lord Jesus Christ, when he saw the throngs, he was moved with pity and sympathy for them because they were bewildered, harassed, distressed, dejected, and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. When he saw the people, he saw their brokenness, he saw their helplessness, he saw that they were dis distressed, dejected, and he was moved. His whole inside was moved with pity. So I want to try to answer that question as best I can. Does God care? Is Jesus interested? I want you to come to the upper room. The Lord Jesus Christ is there with his disciples. 
he has been with them for three years now. He's been trying to tell them that he's on his way to Jerusalem to go to the cross, to die for the sins of the whole world. Not just a few, the sins of the whole world, but the disciples just don't get it. They don't understand. So they come to the Passover supper. The Lord Jesus Christ institutes that, institutes that new cup. Do you remember the cup of the new covenant, his blood, which was shed for you, Jesus said. But there's an amazing verse, Matthew 26 and 30. You grab your Bible, read it. It says that when they sung a hymn, God manifest in flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ sang a hymn. Do you know what he sang? It was one of the Hallel Psalms, Psalm 116 to 118. And I can almost see the Lord Jesus Christ. And unknown to the rest of his disciples, they weren't getting it. But Jesus Christ knew that the very next day he was going to be hanging on a cross. And here's what he's singing. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And after they sing that hymn, they go out to the Mount of Olives and he takes his three disciples, Peter, James and John. He's already warned them that they're going to be like sheep that are scattered, sheep that are completely distressed, displaced because the shepherd is going to go speaking of himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they still don't get it. And so he says to them as he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he says to them, look, will you sit here and watch? I'm just going to pray with the Father. Now picture this. The Lord Jesus Christ, it says that he went a little farther because no one else could have went that far. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. And he fell on his face and he started to pray. And here he prays, Abba, Abba, Father, is there any other way other than the cross whereby we can atone for the sins of the world? Abba, if it's possible, please take this cup from me. But it's not about my will, Father. It's your will that has to be done. And he comes back to his disciples and there they are sleeping and he goes away again. And it says that he prayed a third time. And then it says that he sweat great drops of blood. And that is a medical condition when your body is under so much extreme pressure and distress that your capillaries and your veins start to secrete blood. This is Jesus Christ. And do you know what he's doing? If you think he doesn't care for you, do you know what he's doing? He's crying to God and he's saying, God, is there any way, any other way? whereby we can get salvation for the people of Look Brickland, the people of Bambridge, the people of Newry. Is there any other way other than the cross? And so it's during that time that they come and arrest the Lord Jesus Christ. They take him away. They lead him. They smite him on the face. They take him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Then they take him to Herod. Pilate sends him over there because he hear, hears that Herod, Herod's in the country. And then they bring him back to Pilate. And Pilate washes his hands. And remember, the wife comes with a message to Pilate. And she has had a dream. And she says, look, Pilate, whatever you do, have nothing to do with this just man. This man is innocent. And so Pilate goes out to the people, the very same people that just a few days earlier were welcoming Jesus into the city. They were just crying at the top of their voices, Hosanna, Hosanna, putting down palm trees. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And Pilate comes to the very same people. And he says to the people, what will I do then with Jesus? What do you want me to do with this man? Because I find no fault in him. Do you know what the people say? Crucify him. Crucify him. We don't want this man to reign over our lives. You see, folks, if you're asking the question, does Jesus Christ care, care about the famine and about the pestilences and about the pandemics and about all the brokenness in the world? Yes, he does. He was here on planet Earth. And if he was still back on planet Earth tonight in bodily form, what they cried then... They would cry now, crucify him. We don't want him. He gives sight to the blind. He raised people from the dead. He cast out demons. Yet the people didn't want them. So Pilate washes his hands 
and it says that he delivered Jesus to be scourged. Now I want you to come with me. I'm trying to paint this picture. This has got me tonight. I want you to come with me to the Praetorium. I want you to see as the Lord Jesus Christ is stripped naked. His hands are tied above his head. And the Roman soldiers go across to a table there, lays all the flagellum, whips with bits of bone, bits of broken metal, bits of shard glass. And so they lift the flagellum and they start to just whip ever so softly on the back of the Lord Jesus Christ down onto his thighs, down onto his legs, and they just tenderize the skin to get it soft. And then they start coming down with great force. And that is why the Psalms record for us. They plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. And the Lord Jesus Christ, his back becomes like a plowed field. Can you imagine as the whip comes down and sometimes the metal would catch round the ribs and it is known, if you study Roman crucifixion, it is known that sometimes as the soldier pulled the whip back, ribs would become displaced from the body and dogs would just sit at the pole, the scourging pole to carry away the ribs. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ, his back is like a plowed field, they decide, you know what, this is great, let's make him a king. And so they come and they put a purple robe upon him. They put a reed in his hand. They make a crown of thorns, those thorns that are used to tie firewood in Palestine. Those thorns that are about four to six inches long. And they press it down upon the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blood runs down his brow and they say, heal, heal king. And can you imagine the heat? And the open wounds on his back and his legs and the purple robe starting to stick to those wounds. And then they come and they rip it off him. And them wounds that had started to sort of dry up in the heat, they open afresh again. And the Lord Jesus Christ, after a sleepless night, he's dehydrated. He is broken. He is bruised. And then they put the patibulum, the crossbar, upon his back. And they lead him out. 650 yards down the Via de la Rosa. And it's during this point, as he makes his way down the Via de la Rosa, he stumbles and falls. He is a completely exhausted. And he's carrying the patibulum on his shoulders. And it's then that they call Simon of Cyrene to help him carry it. But the Bible records a real key piece of information for us. It says in the book of Psalms, my heart is like wax. Speaking of Jesus, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. And when that cross beam fell on his chest, it crushed him. And it's then medically that we know that it crushed an artery in the heart. And that is why his heart was like wax. And so here he is, the savior of the world, the one that came to set captives free. He's making his way to Calvary. And they come to the place called Calvary. They lay the Lord Jesus Christ down. They're about to join the patibulum to the stipes. That's the upright post. And so the Roman legionnaire feels for the depression just below the palms of the hands. Because remember, no bone of the Savior was going to be broken. So it didn't go through the palms as we think it did. It went through here, the depression and the wrist. And they take the six inch spikes and they hammer it into his hands. And then they put the two feet together and there was a little platform where they put the feet of their victims and then they hammered the spike through his feet and then they lift the cross. They lift it. And the cross goes into the socket and it jolts back and forward and the Bible records another key part of this crucifixion and information for us. Jesus looks down at all of his bones. And he says that he can tell every single one of them. He can name them because every bone is dislocated. It's out of joint. Can you imagine the agony? And there the cross is lifted up. And Jesus is hanging between heaven and earth. And man has done his worst. Physically. But here's where I want to answer the question in full. Does God really care about you? Does Jesus really care about you? 
because as he hangs on the cross, victims try to push themselves up to try and get some oxygen into their body and exhale some air out of their body, but it's virtually impossible. And as the Lord Jesus Christ hangs on the cross, his pericardium starts to fill with serum. He's starting to drown in his own bodily fluid. His pectoral muscles, his intercostal muscles, they're not working anymore. And victims cannot breathe. They start to suffer horribly. Suffocating in their own fluid. And here's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he looks down from the cross. And people are gambling for his clothes. And he could have, the song's right, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. But he stayed on the cross for you and for me. And he looks down and he says, Father, Abba, just forgive them. These people don't even know what they're doing. Forgiveness, love, care, compassion and all of his pain. But the worst is yet to come. From the sixth hour, that's midday, to the ninth hour, three o'clock, when the sun is at its brightest, temperatures could have been reaching 40 degrees plus. Jesus is hanging on a cross, blood oozing from his broken body, dehydrated, weak. And then, then the ultimate loneliness comes. When God the Father turns his back on his only son. And darkness comes over all the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. The sun refuses to shine. And God lays the sin of the whole world. The whole world. Did you get it? The sin of the whole world. Upon his lovely son. And Jesus takes your punishment, your pain, your brokenness, your hell. And God lays it upon his son instead of you having to suffer it. John 19.30 says the most amazing word ever you will read. Teta lest I. It's finished. Jesus cried, it's finished, Father, it's finished. I've done your will. I've died for the people in Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland. I've died for the people of the world. I've finished the work. I've shed the blood that you asked me to shed on Calvary for them. And Jesus bows his head and dismisses his spirit. Does Jesus care? Jesus care for you. Folks, I want to tell you, I know I'm not going to sit here like a fool and tell you that I don't think this world is broken and in pain. And I'm not going to sit here and belittle your pain and problems. But I am going to sit here and tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ cares. God cares. That's why God gave his only Begotten, beloved son. Because he wanted to take your pain. He wanted to come into a relationship with you where you can enjoy life in all of its fullness. But I don't want to finish there with the cross. Because the message, the gospel message, that's only part of it. When Jesus died, he reconciled you to God. By his death. But I want to finish with this. On the third day Christ rose again. He conquered the grave. He conquered death. He is alive forevermore. And he died once. Never to die again. And in that moment. When he rose from the dead. He offers you and I now. Resurrected life. So the cross has dealt with your sin. Do you get that? 
He cared so much that he dealt with your sin, your hell, your pain, your punishment. But he cared so much that he rose again so that he could impart to you life, transforming life. Oh, Father. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for caring for the three families that I've spoke to today. God, help their loved ones to see that you care. God, help every person watching this wee video from my garden tonight. Help them to understand that Jesus died for them. And Jesus cares. He cares so much. Thank you that the gospel means resurrection. Thank you that you want to impart life to dead people, to make them alive in Christ. Bless everyone in Jesus' name that is watching this wee video. God, save souls. Restore people. God, will you help Christians understand what it cost to redeem them. Wake them up. Wake them out of their sleep. Help them to be like Christ, moved with compassion. And see others through the lens of Jesus Christ. Because I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Bless you.